Fantastic. Thank you so much. I, I'm already mic'd. Uh, um, thank you so much, uh, everybody, for being to this session. Uh, uh, as Armin said, I'm, I'm Guglielmo Volpe. I'm election economist at Queen Mary. Uh, I don't have a direct involvement with core economics, but I've been helping with the empirical project on the uh, economy, society, and, and the public economics uh, uh, part of, uh, of the core project. And what I'm going to do next is to talk a little bit about how I embedded this into, into my uh, module. Um, with, with Fabio, we had a long discussion about how we should organize our session and so on, who should go first and who should go second and so on, mainly because uh, uh, of the, the slightly different approach that, uh, that we are taking. So I'm taking more a hands-on uh, kind of uh, applied approach, uh, while Fab, uh, Fabio is going to have a more holistic approach to, to his uh, um, session. So uh, what I wanted to do is to talk to you about uh, Oh, well, actually, let me go back a second. Um, uh, Wendy, earlier on, was talking about uh, the methodology that has been used in uh, uh, the development of uh, a core, in particular the idea of starting from the problem, uh, using data to then uh, try to work out uh, the theory behind it, and then apply the theory to try to explain the uh, unexplained and, and so on. What I wanted to do here is to say, okay, so if I have a core, then how can, could I embed it into my uh, teaching in a way that I try to engage my students as well. And uh, what I'm going to do is to show to you two possibilities. I call them the old and uh, uh, the new. Uh, the old one is what I refer to as uh, problem-based learning. I don't know whether any of you has uh, is familiar with problem-based learning? Uh, has any of you used the problem-based learning in the past? Uh, some, some of you have. Uh, fantastic, because I have actually a problem to give uh, you to, to actually do. So I know that uh, you will enjoy this. Uh, but to, to be honest, we don't really have a, I'll give this to you to distribute. Uh, I don't think we have time to do go through the problem, but what I want to do is to start by showing to you possibly, uh, yeah, would you mind? Uh, showing to you a, a particular uh, problem. Uh, I linked the problem to unit five and the unit 19 of uh, uh, core about inequality. Can I, can I just ask you to take maybe a minute to look, uh, to look at uh, the, uh, the problem or the task? Thank you so much. Uh, tell me what, when, uh, when you are ready. But this is basically um, how a problem-based learning uh, would start. Uh, it, it starts with a task. It starts, starts with a problem. And uh, the idea is uh, to drive students' learning uh, not uh, through something that uh, we teach uh, students, uh, but uh, through a discovery process that uh, students uh, go through uh, by the mean of uh, a task or a problem that uh, you as an educator set for the students. And that's, that's the basic essence of, of problem-based learning. So the, the, idea, the idea is that there is a problem that the, the lecturer sets for students uh, to develop. The problem is set up in such a way 
that the kind of learning outcomes that we wanted to achieve are developed throughout the task. Students usually work in groups on this task and they work on the task and they produce some sort of response to the teacher and then the teacher provides some feedback to uh, students and uh, this is uh, the, the basic uh, process so it's an itera uh, iteration kind of process whereby students uh, meet for the first time they are given uh, the particular task that uh, uh, the lecturer has set and then there is an opportunity for stu to students to, st to brainstorm ask any question to uh, the, the lecturer and then students uh, go away and then uh, work on the task by the following week students uh, come back uh, with uh, a uh, answer to, to the task which they can present to, uh, to the class, present to the, to the le lecturer, and the lecturer provides uh, feedback uh, on uh, the uh, proposed answer, and then students uh, go away and then uh, they complete uh, the task and they submit uh, their uh, finished work. And this is the, the, the process of problem-based learning. And I think uh, the core uh, material really, in my view, lends uh, quite itself uh, to, be, to this approach because there is uh, the, the, the whole uh, um, uh, emphasis of uh, core is very much on uh, data uh, driving uh, questions and issues, and really this is very much the foundations of uh, uh, problem-based learning. So uh, if you are looking for a way to embed a core into your curriculum, and if you are looking uh, for a way to uh, engage students actively into their learning, uh, then I think a problem-based learning can be an approach that uh, you might want uh, to uh, consider. Um, there are some issues that uh, you need to, to be aware of uh, in, in this respect. So there are some issues that uh, uh, need to be talked about. One, one is, what, okay, so if the students uh, have to do the work, so what is the role of the lecturer here? And uh, what about designing the task? Uh, what about uh, the assessment per se? And all this uh, should be framed within the, the general idea of uh, what am I going to do? Am I going to do a complete a problem-based learning or uh, a partial problem-based learning. Uh, what do I mean with partial and complete? What I mean is that uh, you might uh, consider the, the very radical idea of uh, getting rid of the lecture altogether. So in other words, uh, the learning is really driven by students who do the reading uh, that uh, the task requires them to do. And the students uh, do the research that uh, they are asked to do. And the students uh, produce the output that uh, you as a lecturer set for them. So the idea is that there is no lecture, uh, but there is only support that uh, uh, lecturers provide to students uh, through uh, specific contact time uh, during uh, the uh, semester. The alternative is instead of to have a partial problem-based learning where you will still retain the, the, the lecture, but the actual learning is still driven by these tasks that you set for students. So the, the question is how, which way you want, to, you want to go. There are examples of both of them. Uh, problem-based learning was, was born originally in uh, the medical schools, uh, uh, but then spread uh, quite uh, quickly into other disciplines and is taught and is used uh, with large, very large groups and very small groups as well. Some universities have made it uh, its own uh, uh, teaching, uh, preferred teaching approach. So Maastricht University in uh, Holland, for example, tends to teach according to uh, problem-based learning. So that's kind of things that uh, you, you might want to, to figure out. Uh, the, the, the question is, what, what, is, what would be your role in this, in this respect? The, the role of the lecturer is very much about uh, being more a facilitator rather than, uh, than a lecturer. So you're not really teaching to the students, but you're really, you're really facilitating and helping their uh, support uh, through uh, the engagement uh, in the feedback that you provide to students uh, to, to tasks. So the idea is very much to, to facilitate students' learning, provide a regular feedback to students, uh, and uh, manage the group's uh, activities and all the challenges that come with managing uh, groups as, uh, as well. But so, th so the role of the lecturer is to some extent uh, uh, changed uh, in here. The other issue is about the task design. I don't know whether you have noticed from the task I've given to you, I tried as much as possible to be exhaustive in terms of identifying what are the learning outcomes. So what, what is that I want students to learn by the end of this task? 
and that the task is designed in terms of the content and in terms of the questions in turn to elicit the development of these uh, uh, learning uh, uh, outcomes. And uh, on, the, on, on the task as well, I try to, to put uh, some sort of uh, uh, time scale as well. So the idea would be that uh, there is week one uh, where you meet with students and uh, you give the task a uh, brainstorming and then students uh, go away. Ta uh, week two, when the students come back with uh, a first initial response to their task uh, and then uh, you give uh, them feedback and then week three when students uh, deliver the uh, finished uh, uh, product. And uh, uh, so, so the, idea, the idea is that you need to be clear about what uh, you hope students to learn from this task. You want to align the learning outcomes to the activities that the students want to do. And what you want is to think about all the possible kind of challenges or difficulties that might emerge during the development of the task. So maybe you need to look ahead and see, will, will students have all the material that they need to access for this particular task? Will students' timetable allow them to work on a regular basis throughout the week to be able to meet and uh, address the issue and, and so on? So these, these, these are the kind of issues that uh, you need, uh, you need to, be, uh, to consider uh, when developing the, the task. Um, it is a, it's useful uh, to try to link up the tasks to assessment, not necessary, but useful to give incentives to students to uh, take the, star, the, the uh, tasks seriously. Surely the task should be used to provide feed, uh, formative feedback to, to students, uh, but usually it's, it's good to link the tasks to some sort of uh, uh, formal assessment. Now the task can be any type of task. I've given you a, a kind of uh, empirical task uh, where students need to, to go away, produce some answers and so on, but the task can be, can be some posters that students need to produce, can be a kind of a university challenge activity that they need to do, it can be a presentation that they need to deliver, it can be, can be anything in this respect. Um, group work can be a bit of a challenge in this respect, uh, um, in particular if you have a, a, a large number, number of groups, but usually if you make it clear what the expectations are from each student and uh, uh, from their relationship within, within each group, uh, usually you, this can be sorted out quite, uh, quite easily. I use, for example, a system of uh, peer evaluation where I ask uh, by the end of the semester for each student to evaluate each other's students contribution to the works uh, or to the group's uh, activity. Uh, if, if you have final exam as well, it uh, would be good to link this up to uh, problem-based learning uh, as well. So for example, you might ask students uh, to do some work during the semester and you're telling them that that is some work that will be assessed uh, in the final exam, for example. Um, one of the things that I've done last year is to use one of the empirical projects uh, from uh, the uh, Economy, Society and Public uh, Policy uh, part of CORE on the sugar tax. And uh, what I did is I gave students uh, uh, the uh, files uh, from the sugar tax research and I asked the students to actually replicate the research paper produced by the, the researchers. For me this linked quite well to some of the material that I was covering in my module. This, I used this uh, task in the first year module called Economics in Action where students are expected to use Excel to learn about key descriptive statistics which are commonly used in economics analysis. And uh, uh, the task worked uh, like a treat. Uh, students found uh, the task extremely engaging. Uh, they were uh, very, very critical of uh, the, the quality of the data to start with and on the fact on whether the data really was proving that the sugar tax was working or, or not. So there was a lot of debate going on and, and so on. And the learning was, was really quite active and, and dynamic in, uh, in the classroom. Um, I don't know whether there is any question um, about uh, um, problem-based learning. Uh, I think. I Sorry, David Hope Kings. 
uh, this is really an uh, interesting uh, way of teaching. I'm just wondering how in the courses where you use these types of methods, how, how you fit it in with, uh, say, the structure that we have for the, the Principles of Economics, which uses core, is two-hour lecture and then a one-hour seminar per week. Um, given this one task on quite a narrow part of the ebook is is taking three weeks. I just wonder how it how it fits in, and do you manage to cover the sort of breadth of material that would be expected for this type of course? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good uh, it's a good question. There is a, there is a general issue with problem based learning, which is that if you plan to use problem based learning, the likelihood that you will be able to cover everything that you want is not high. So probably you will need to sacrifice some of the material. The answer, the question is, uh, is the sacrifice worth the benefit uh, from doing it? My feeling is uh, that it is, uh, because uh, uh, problem-based learning leads uh, really students uh, to develop uh, a much deeper learning and understanding of the material. But on the other hand, then you might find frictions with, uh, for example, next year's modules if you're not able to cover some particular material and, and so on. I think the issue is to see, can you design tasks in such a way that they are as comprehensive as possible and cover as much of the material as possible? Now, don't take the, the activity I've done there as necessarily um, um, something that you have to do, but I was just thinking, when I, when I designed it, I was thinking about the module I teach, where I have a, a lecture on uh, measures of ranking and a lecture on inequality, and so Lawrence gave engineering coefficient, so I thought I could put these into, so two weeks into, kind of two weeks and a half of work, uh, per se. But it's, 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 it's an issue to think about. complement to lectures or as a substitute? As, no. It is, it, is an, it is an applied, yes. Uh, um, but the, the method is used, so the problem based learning has been used also in principles, so to teach micro or macroeconomics as, as well. Um, I'll tell you one thing I did. Uh, I managed to convince my school to get rid of lectures. Uh, so I don't have lectures of two hours. I have uh, two hours classes with students. One is an IT class, one is uh, a kind of a workshop. Uh, class. It's more costly, yeah, but I managed to convince the school that this would work. And I can tell you the students uh, never raised an issue about, oh, we didn't have a lecture, why didn't we have a lecture? And so, so they were quite uh, happy to engage in the weekly activities uh, and uh, in uh, the weekly classes that, that we what had. Size is this, what the, size? the module is 220 students. So you have, uh, you're doing this uh, how to put a combined classroom lecture for 200 or something. Correct, yes. Mm -hmm. Dan, question. Uh, Dan Rigby, Manchester. I just, uh, thanks very much. Um, so I've got some questions about logistics. I know there's flexibility. I'm not looking for a complete template mm -hmm. on how I teach. But um, so I can appreciate the first meeting you could have as a mass meeting where you're briefing the students. In terms of those, them presenting their initial interim work and that meeting where you give them feedback at second meeting so are you having a scheduled meeting where you had just meet that group or they how are you working that given that you can have a lot of groups or are you devolving this to TAs etc which is about <laughs> the number of those second meetings etc can add up to a lot of meetings I suspect. Yeah so I for example for, for uh, the module I teach I, I have groups of 20 students so and I have two two hours with them we spend a bit of time in one hour in the uh, IT lab uh, doing uh, work, work in Excel. The second hour is usually an hour where I ask one or two groups to give a short presentation. And the short presentation becomes an opportunity for me to give uh, feedback to the groups who are presenting and also for the other students uh, to check what other groups are doing. And then they can then listen to my feedback. The feedback I give to the groups is worthwhile for the other groups as well. And then I spend uh, five, ten minutes with the other groups uh, to check uh, how they are doing with, uh, with their work as well. Okay, so you're not, it's a sort of, they're all benefiting from that, it's a, that's still a joint event and they're just seeing the feedback on the, okay, Correct, so you're not yeah. having individual meetings with them, it's still. Yeah, usually, mm -hmm. usually students have found that kind of uh, plenary session quite useful because they start saying, oh my God, do I need to do that? Mm -hmm. And say, like, yeah, you need, oh my God, I didn't think about that. So then you go, or other students are question the quality of uh, some work that others are doing. So it becomes quite a lively and engaging uh, uh, environment uh, uh, that where people can, can really raise, uh, raise value issues. Thank you.
Uh, shall, I, shall I move on uh, to, uh, to flipping? Yeah? And then maybe we can, you can, we can ask uh, have questions later on. Um, flipping is the new. So problem-based learning was the old. Flipping is the new. I always find it a bit difficult to reconcile uh, flipping new with uh, the, the old, but anyway, so flipping, flipping is the new. And uh, uh, again, the, the, the idea is that uh, we might have, uh, I don't know, a hypothetical week 10 uh, where we have uh, a uh, particular topic, uh, which is income inequality. And what you are asking to do is to tell students, look, guys, uh, next week, week 10, the weekly topic will be uh, income inequality. So what I want you to do is uh, to read the uh, units uh, 5 and 19 of uh, core. And what I want you to do is uh, to go on the VLE, look at the videos that I posted up there, and also read uh, the additional notes and material that uh, I have posted up there. Okay, so what I want you guys is uh, by next week to come back prepared to do the tasks. Now, um, before the lecture, students uh, would be expected to complete uh, an online quiz, an online test, which uh, uh, if you want, uh, you can complete uh, yourself. Uh, I don't know whether you are, fam are you familiar with Socrative? Uh, Socrative is an... Uh, online uh, um, audience response uh, system. I don't know whether you wanted to, uh, to play the, 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 the quiz. If you, if you take out uh, your mobile phone or your laptop uh, or uh, tablets uh, or any kind of uh, gadgetry you have in, uh, uh, at your disposal, uh, you can go to Socrative.com, so Socrative.com. And uh, under Socrative.com, you should find uh, a menu which allows you for uh, student, uh, student login. And for student login, you should specify uh, this uh, code here, VOLPE, V-O-L-P-E, 1265. Uh, sorry, is uh, V-O-L-P-E. One, two, six, five. That's the code to give you access to the quiz. V O L P E. One, two, six, five. So V for Victor, O for O, L for Lima, P for potato, E for elephant. Uh, one, two, six, five. <laughs> You need to log in as a student. Does it work? Eh? Yeah. So you, you should be able to see the question. So there are 13 of you that are logged in. <laughs> Uh, sorry, the, log the login name, sorry, I don't know why it's so invisible, uh, is V-O-L-P-E. Oh, i got to enter my name now. Yeah. One, two, six, five. Uh, this question is actually one of the questions in the core textbook. So I, I don't claim originality. Pure plagiarism at every level. So, so again, uh, while you are doing all this, um, of course, uh, you can use this in the classroom, OK? So if you have Wi-Fi in your classroom and students have uh, access uh, to tablets and, and so on, so you can use this in the classroom. And uh, this is something that you might want to do if you are flipping your lectures, OK? But. Uh, um, the, the idea here is just to show to you how it works. And, and the idea, however, is that uh, in, in a flipped environment, uh, students are expected to do preparation work yeah, before they come to the lecture. Students should not come to the lecture with the expectation that you are going to lecture them. Yeah? 
They are coming to the lecture to engage uh, in a deeper understanding and deeper learning of the material which they have read uh, on uh, their own. They can test their understanding of their learning through this online quiz that will take place before the lecture. Yeah? So students have read Unit 5 of core and they learned about that this thing called the Lorentz curve and they know that there are these areas A and B in a Lorentz curve and then they are asked this question to prove that they got an understanding of what this means. Um, so, uh, so let's check uh, how we did. Uh, so we had 50% of correct answers. <laughs> so 21 of incorrect answers. So uh, I think I will need uh, to spend a little bit of time in my <laughs> lecture to clarify this issue. Yeah. So, so the idea is that you use uh, the uh, um, quiz that students uh, complete uh, before the lecture to get an understanding of areas uh, uh, where students uh, might need uh, further support. So that when the lecture comes, you might want to tailor uh, your activities with students uh, to, may, for example, these issues about the, these two areas, uh, A and B, under a Lorentz curve. Yeah? Yeah? Is it possible with this software to put a picture of the figure in there? It's a good question. I think it is possible. I haven't <coughs> tried myself, I have to say. But I think it's possible. Uh, I know that you want another question, isn't it? Uh, so again, uh, I don't claim originality here. This comes from core textbook. Disposable income is market income uh, plus uh, cash transfers uh, minus direct uh, taxes. You should be able to see this question on the screen. So maybe you can... Uh, answer this question while I'm tying my laces. Again, so, so the, the, idea, the idea is that, of course, to students are, are unlikely to answer these questions unless uh, probably there is some reward. So you might want to link uh, these quizzes, uh, these before lecture quizzes, to some marks. Uh, that uh, you award to students. Uh, could be one mark for 80% of correct answers or what, what, whatever you want to, to set. But the idea is to give incentives to students to complete uh, these online quizzes before the lectures. So let, let, shall we see how we are doing? Uh, oh, yeah, so you seem to have understood this concept <laughs> fairly OK. So I don't think that uh, we need to spend much more time. So I can dedicate uh, my time in the lecture to other things rather than than this one. Okay, so let me go back to my slides. So, so the idea is that the students have done the, the reading in advance. They, they took the, the quiz uh, and then they are coming to lecture. What are you going to do in the lecture? Are, are you going to teach again? No. The lecture should really be driven by, again, tasks, problems, activities you have set up to help a student foster a deeper understanding of the material. You will have some understanding from the quizzes whether there are areas where you need to work a little bit more, but the idea would be to have a set of activities that can help foster a greater understanding. Uh, of uh, uh, students. So the idea would be that uh, you can start uh, the session with uh, one particular problem, so you can pose a particular question to students. Again, the, I don't claim originality, but this question comes uh, from uh, the core uh, textbook. Uh, so uh, the table shows alternative distribution of land ownership. Uh, so can you sketch uh, the Lorentz curve and can you compute the Gini coefficient? Yeah? So the idea is that uh, you set this problem up and you tell students, okay, guys, on your own, using an audience response system, you, they can give you the answer to the question. Yeah? So then what happens uh, is that uh, students uh, think uh, and then they vote. So they produce the answer to you. And then at this point, you will see what the answers are. Probably you get a distribution. Some get it right, some get it wrong. And then you tell the students, hey, guys, 
why don't you talk to whoever is next to you, group, little groups of three, two, three, four people, and then have a discussion on what you think is the actual correct answer here. And then what happens is then the students vote again, and then there is a quick class discussion to iron out any misunderstanding or any issues that need further clarification, and then you confirm and then you summarize. And then you move on for the next, to be the next problem. Yeah. How do you, yeah. Sorry. How do you incentivize the students to participate in the quiz in the lecture? Or, or do you still have uh, some kind of assessment marks attached to that? Uh, I, I don't. Uh, uh, I think uh, students usually like uh, these kind of activities in the classroom. They don't really need uh, I mean, if, if you set a problem, which is a bit of a challenge, then they really want to show that they can, they can do it. So my experience is that uh, the, the, moment, the moment you start doing these things, then they, they participate. So you, I don't think you need it necessarily to, to, to do it. I think Fabio can, can also provide more evidence uh, about it. So, so the idea is that you have this, uh, this uh, cycle in, in the class where you, you set up these various problems. And what you do is that you design these problems to make sure that the students get a deeper understanding of the material you want them to learn from the activity. But the idea is what? The idea is that you don't spend two hours flat out teaching about a particular topic, explaining and so on. You have the opportunity to engage with students at a deeper level, get a bit a better understanding of what they understand of the concept. And also you get an understanding of how do they think about the the problem. So they, they will tell you, oh, the answer is this. And you say, how did you get there? And uh, so you get a better understanding of their thought processes, which is of sometimes often something that we don't always get uh, from, from, from students. So the idea is the idea of uh, then having uh, students uh, helping each other. So this peer instruction is very much uh, at uh, the, the center of the process here with students helping each other out uh, to get a better and deeper understanding of the subject. And then uh, Fabio will tell you a little bit more about this in just a second. Um, then of course there are uh, workshops or tutorials that will complement the lecture and then you can uh, or organize and, uh, and decide how you want uh, to organize these activities on top of the lecture. But the idea of flipping is very much about uh, changing the nature of uh, the, the, the lecture from uh, a a unidirectional process where you teach to students to a lively environment where you engage with students on a discussion of different questions that will drive students' learning. And I think, again, core, in my view, lends itself quite well. Think about some of the graphs we have seen today. You can easily put some of these graphs on, on the screen and then ask students to make sense of them or so on. So there is an awful lot that you can actually uh, do. Let me just conclude with a couple of things. Is <laughs> uh, an issue, isn't it? Uh, stu students come with a mindset. Uh, so is a lecture. I'm ready to, to be talked to. I am ready to listen. So no, you're not going to listen. You're going to do things. And, and I think it's going to be a bit challenging at the beginning to, to change the frame of mind of students from a passive one to a positive, active one where they needed to do the work in advance and then they need to engage in the classroom as well. I think at the moment you are clear about the expectations and then you establish clear class norms and so on, you, then this will eventually rub off the students. Once students understand and appreciate the value of what you are doing, then they will start following you in that sense. Um, what, what is your role? Uh, keep, uh, keep in mind that, that uh, uh, in the classroom, uh, the material will never be new material for the students. They will have read it. Yeah? So what you want to do is really to piggy bank on what they have read and understood to give them a better and deeper understanding of uh, the material. You don't need to cover everything. So they, they know the difference between the disposable income and gross income. I, I don't need to do it. I'll move on. I'll do something else. I'll do something more more relevant or more interesting or more complicated or, more, or something that they might find more uh, challenging. There might be something that uh, still 
is tricky for them to understand. So you might say, okay, okay guys, stop, stop, stop. Five minutes, let me explain this concept to you again. So you might give a five minutes explanation, but you don't give a two hours uh, lecture. Um, problems can emerge while you're, you are uh, explaining. So issues might emerge and then so you can try to address these issues uh, real time. So there might be questions that students have and you can address uh, them uh, directly. It's difficult that this might happen in a standard uh, uh, lecture in instead. Uh, students are more likely to be quite queued up. So if they've done their, their reading, if they're engaging with the tasks, uh, then they're more likely to be keen of engaging uh, actively with you. Um, uh, a, I think the, the time in the classroom is very much a good time for uh, telling uh, students and telling stories about uh, what you want them to, to understand. And you have a lot of flexibility. Leave some material out, move on, focus on some areas and, and so on. So the, the, the environment becomes much more uh, uh, dynamic. So I'll conclude here and I'll leave the stage to, to, to Fabio. So these are just a couple of ideas of how you can take a core embed uh, in uh, your teaching in a way which is engaging uh, for the students. Uh, so uh, core is designed to engage students' interest, yeah? So what you want to do, harness it by engaging actively with the students in the classroom. Sorry, good glimmer. Just quickly to pick up on this issue about um, how to get students to engage with the material beforehand and actually read it. Um, what, um, what we found in Bristol was that, uh, not surprisingly, assessment is your best friend, really, because there used to be this kind of pact by where um, students expected that what you taught in the lectures was going to be examined, and that was the basis on which they didn't do work outside the lecture and they did it in the lecture instead. And so by saying, by being really clear to students that these are the chapters in core that will be examined. These are the bits that will be in the exam, but we're not necessarily going to go through it in the lecture. That really does focus minds. And there's a very, uh, I can't remember who it was. I think it was the uh, uh, vice principal of Manipal uh, University in India who, uh, who used to start her lecture series by saying that um, uh, the, the, this is what's in the course, you know, chapters one to 14 and chapter 16, uh, but we're not gonna be able to get through it all in the lectures, but don't worry because whatever I don't cover in the lectures will be covered in the examination. <laughs> but it really does focus people's minds. Fabio. Uh, fantastic. Maybe we can, if you have any questions, we can leave them at, at the end and I'll leave the stage to, to Fabio, which uh, we'll, we'll talk uh, more about the peer instructions and the benefits of, you're already queued up. Okay, so right. So, well, um, you know who I am. The only thing that it might be useful is uh, add me to your Twitter and please tweet with me. Uh, I, I, I tend to have like waves of uh, Twitter euphoria and then I come down and then I pop up again and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, I think it's quite a useful tool, especially if you're interested in uh, teaching and whatever level. So what I would like to, to do today is uh, taking a, a bit of a broader uh, approach to what uh, active learning is, at least to me. And um, I don't claim to cover and to be exhaustive, but I'm gonna tell you what is my story and what I what I, uh, what I did in my own uh, module, uh, and hopefully you can take uh, something home and find it useful for yourselves. Um, I think that Halvin uh, has covered uh, the issue of active learning being like reinvented the wheel. Uh, we, are, we, are, we are talking about stuff that has been there since Socrates, and this idea there is a dialogical approach to teaching. Um, so uh, we are not saying anything new, yet so many colleagues are still sticking to the lecture as the best way to convey material and to have students learning. And, and students, as, as William also discussed before, they actually expected, you know, the, the typical narrative, I paid 9,000 pounds and now you teach me. That's your job. That's what I expect you to do. Um, um, it, it's quite difficult, it, it, it's quite a difficult paradigm to break, yeah? So that's the reason why we still need to talk about active learning and discuss around it and explore it and trying to find ways to make it uh, ours. Yeah? So um, active learning comprises a lot of different uh, pedagogies, and this is pretty much what I do uh, in my approach. I use a lot of uh, peer instruction, um, as you saw with Guglielmo, I'm gonna give you some of my own uh, take with that. Class discussion, I got 250 students, so it's quite challenging 
but I still managed to promote some class discussion. And I strongly believe that self-assessment is another important ingredient of my uh, pedagogical blend. Um, and I'm going to tell you why. So um, I'm, I'm going to be sharing slides. The slides are going to be available. So peer instruction was born uh, in the physics. And little by little, it's taking over in social sciences. Humanities are still quite resistant to that because they feel that if you don't have a right wrong answer, you cannot use it. That's really not true. It's all about generating debate and having students exchange ideas in the classroom. Um, so as I said, what I like to do um, within the peer instruction algorithm that Guglielmo has already demonstrated is uh, adding a component of self-assessment. And I do that because I teach first year students and I find that I spend 50% of my office hours not talking about economics. I spend 50% of my office hours patting shoulders, wiping up tears, and telling students they're going to be fine. And not just those who are struggling, but also those who are very well performing, but they're not aware that they are actually doing very well. Um, this might be because of the kind of uh, uh, recruitment pool that we have in my institution. We recruit students who have possibly yes or no A-level in mathematics, yes or no A-level in economics. So quite a lot of uh, heterogeneity uh, within this group. And students compare notes with each other, and they say, oh my god, what, what is happening? Yeah? So I went to dig into the literature, and I started to reflect on what could be done, and how to elicit confidence in students. And I found this concept by Bandura, so, so academic self-efficacy self uh, self as confidence at performing specific academic tasks or achieving specific uh, objectives. And Bandura was the cognitive psychologist who explore this concept, we crafted this concept, um, comes to tell us that there are different ways to elicit uh, self-efficacy. And guess what? The most important one is doing things. What a surprise. Yeah. If you have people talking to you, um, you say, yeah, I mean, I, uh, I can do that. But the fact that you're actually experimenting, do something yourself, is going to be even more important. It's going to be the experience that is going to give you even more confidence ever. And to me, that is extremely uh, important. So, how do I try to elicit confidence in my students? Well, by teaching them to self-assess. If you know where you stand, if you're doing well, you know you're doing well. If you're not doing well, you can go and ask for help. Yeah? So um, this is the kind of uh, additional ingredient that I, uh, I added to my uh, pedagogical blend. So I've been teaching introductory macroeconomics at the University of East Anglia since I moved down there. Uh, six years ago, and the um, population of students has increased quite a lot. I'm facing classes of 250 students. We still have retained uh, some lectures, partially because of this problem I was telling you about. Transition for my court of students is quite problematic. There is a lot of heterogeneity, and I didn't feel like giving up lectures entirely. And that's my story. might not apply to you, uh, but this is the way I'm doing it. Hopefully, what I can show you is that even in lectures, there is a lot of active learning going on. Then we have uh, seminars, so traditional pre-assigned problem set, small groups. Uh, you find with your mates, a tutor is just going to help you to uh, find your way through the solution, clarify any doubt. And then we have workshops. And workshops are my pride and joy. In workshops, I just uh, split the class in two large groups. Students walk into a problem set I've never seen before. It's all multiple choice questions. And there is a lot of peer instruction going on. And I'm going to show you in a second uh, what I'm doing. So as I was telling you, um, even in lectures, um, I retain lectures. But even in lectures, I, there are a lot of elements of active learning that are still present. So you can still transform a lecture in something that is quite active. Um, the easiest one, Socrative questioning. Um, it does, it's, not, it, it's absolutely false that you cannot promote Socrative questioning in a large class. You ask questions, and you say, oh, you know, possibly always the usual suspects are going to give you the answer because the other are too conscious. Yes, but I bet you that a lot of them are still thinking about what is the correct answer. And because they are, some sort of learning is taking place nevertheless. That's my first clue. Um, so, to give some sort of continuity, I ask questions about what happened in the previous lecture. And so similar to what Guglielmo does in the pre-active learning phase in his own, uh, in his own uh, class. Um, 
when I cover a particular challenging topic, I immediately ask a question to check whether the class has actually got it and clarify any doubt before students take it home and crystallize it in some sort of very wrong uh, ideas that shouldn't be there. So formative quizzes during the lecture. Um, but very important for me, I also gather feedback about what is going on uh, at the end of each specific lecture. So I got their feedback about my teaching. And initially, I was asking questions about whether the lecture was enjoyable. And she just came to me and said, oh, but lectures are not supposed to be enjoyable. And I was like, why? Well, so I asked them, OK, well, what do you think should be the question I, I should ask? And I say, well, you should ask whether that is interesting. And I say, OK, you chose it. And this is going to be our evaluation parameter. So the students chose that. And so they rank their interest on a scale from one to four. Yeah? Um, but also, I'm very interested in knowing whether students are finding the material difficult. Why? Because on the basis of that indicator, I can go back to them in the following lecture and calibrate and recalibrate the material, having a chat with them. Um, so I use clickers to do so. We got uh, uh, like scales or multiple choices according to what you're asking opinion questions, ranking questions, or uh, uh, correct versus incorrect choices. I have a dialogue with the students because when this distribution of agreement or disagreement, confidence and not confidence appears on the screen, I go pointing at different groups of students. And I tell to those who are not happy about something going on, you need to come and see me. Come and see me. I got office hours. Come and see me. You know, um, I was asking students, uh, uh, we were joking about what is the mantra that each individual lecturer has. And all of us have our own catchphrases that we come for repeating when we are in the classroom. And apparently mine is come and see me. <laughs> but it's good. It's good. Um, I can also reflect on my practice according to what is going on in real time. So just get back to the students in real time. What I also do, because I like multitasking, I run online forums during lectures as well. And um, so basically, uh, the kind of software I use is Go Softbox, but you can find many others. This is my favorite, in my opinion, in terms of forums. It works very, very well. Um, for each lecture, there is a code. So for each lecture, there is a, an open room. And as soon as the material is available for the students to see before the lecture, students can start to ask questions. And so uh, I work into class, and questions are already there. Some of those are already there. Um, students are free to ask anything. And this is pretty much up to the fact that I'm prepared and open to do so. Um, it might not be your cup of tea, so you might want to focus uh, the students on asking questions about topics. So I get all sorts of questions going on. Um, why do I indulge and ask any kind of ans uh, um, uh, answer any kind of questions uh, that students ask? Because that's one of my tricks to keep them engaged. So in the middle of the lecture, I, you know, I might get a question about which football team I support, and I say Juventus, and then I carry on. I hope nobody has a problem with Juventus. Um, that's, uh, and then I carry on. You know. All helps keeping the students engaged. These are little tricks. You know, they're not going to gener generate huge learning. You know, but they're all little tricks that actually work. Yeah. Um, I received all this, uh, I, I followed all this interaction on my mobile, students can also do so. I don't feel like uh, splatting everything on the screen because every, anything can happen in real time. So uh, there is a bit of multitasking, there is me teaching, scribbling, uh, working on the computer and checking my mobile as the forum goes on, but trust me, I can do that, so I'm sure you can as well. Um, and Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the important thing is that there is a commitment that everything I'm not able to cover in, uh, uh, in real time is going to be addressed at the end of the lecture. Um, once I post uh, feedback material on the VLE, everything is going to go there. And trust me, a lot of questions are repeating themselves. You know, students have common issues, common points on which they're actually struggling. So um, after building a sort of uh, answer bank, you are uh, capitalizing on what is going to happen the following time you run exactly the same session. Um, but you get a really clear insights about what is going on in the classroom, what is going on in their learning, and what, are, what they are interested in. They ask me a lot of questions about what's going on in the news. And, and I think it's great. Um, uh, 
So I am willing to engage, but rather than me posing them an issue, I just follow up on what they're talking about and trying to link into what we are covering in terms of theoretical material, um, in terms of the model that we are exploring in a particular session. Another very good uh, point is uh, solving the true velocity system. What I was telling you is that in first years, our population is very heterogeneous. We got students with background and students with not background. So we got students who are struggling on one side, and we got students who will say, oh, I've seen it in A-level already, why you're telling this to me again. So you're teaching to the average, but no, nobody's in the average group. And how can make everybody happy? Well, fact is that you know, by running parallel conversations or allowing students to run parallel conversation, nobody gets bored. And, and this to me is it's really, really helpful to, to keep the students who have already seen the material, especially in the first semester. Second semester, pretty much everybody is already on the, on the same boat. You know. um, helps to keep everybody engaged. Um, and, uh, and creating a sense of community. Students can respond to each other's questions. So there is no even need of my intervention. And that's the reason why I can manage to cover so many questions. The students are helping me doing my job. Um, so that is. Uh, so that is pretty good. Um, but let me tell you about workshops. Workshops, as I was telling you, are my pride and joy. It's the real moment where the class is completely flipped. Um, so students walk into a problem set of, say, something like uh, eight to 10 questions, multiple choices, four possible exits. This is the way I do it. You can craft as many as you want. It's a two-hour session, possibly physically the most tiring ever. Um, and what I do is asking students questions, and then teaching them how to self-assess their performance according to an algorithm that I'm going to show you uh, very shortly. So um, this fact allows me to cover and to address the issue of how to raise a student confidence as well. So let me tell you about my teaching algorithm. Um, Guglielmo has already covered uh, one that is very much uh, um, in use. Uh, all of those using peer instruction, my contribution is adding a self-assessment component to this. So I ask a question, students are going to respond, the distribution of answer is not revealed, and immediately after, I ask students to self-assess their performance or how they feel about being able to address the question. Yeah? So question, I'm going to show you an example in a second. In this case, I do reveal the distribution of answers. Why? Because I want students to see especially those who are struggling, that they are not the only one. Every student, or the majority of students who are struggling that I met in my career, they feel they are, they are the only one. And they're very conscious about that. And showing them that they are struggling along with another group of students makes them feel much better. Yeah? So um, I show the distribution of answers. Then I invite students to talk to each other. So the peer instruction is taking place. And then, guess what? I ask exactly the same question again. I sometimes I reveal what is the correct uh, answer at this stage. Some other times, I ask them to self-assess first prior to revealing, because I want to check what's the impact of me teaching the students, rather than them talking to each other generates on, uh, on the effectiveness of my uh, approach. So this is the kind of teaching algorithm. So, these are samples that I give uh, when I talk to non-economists. Non so I ask a very simple question. But just to give you an idea, this will be round one. So you ask a question for a possible exit. And then you go around two. This is the kind of uh, self-assessment uh, uh, question that I ask, uh, 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 that I started to ask recently. This is much more aligned with the construct of self-efficacy. Um, I changed this over the years. I, I was asking, I feel confident about having given the right answer. And I can tell you that analyzing the data, I didn't see any particular difference whatsoever. So this question is quite robust. All the results that you get out of the self-assessment question have been quite robust uh, with respect to the kind of question I've been asking. So in this case, the distribution of answers will be revealed. And so we'll say, come and see me. Come and see me. If you're not happy, come and see me. Yeah? Um, and then I will ask the same question again. You know, hell raises on earth because all the classes just talking to each other. What you have to develop when you do this approach is a sort of gut feelings and just kind of finding out when is the right time to wrap it up and close the poll. Um, 
but something changes in the volume, something changes in the dynamic, and you're here, you starting to pick different things. And I say, okay, guys, are we talking about pre-drinks for this evening or economics? And, and responses are coming in, and you know that it's time to move on. Apparently, there is a device that he, um, I, I really want to try it. It sounds like uh, magic. That you can put, it's got a, um, a microphone, you put it on your lecture, and apparently he listens to the noise in the classroom and he measures how much learning is happening. <laughs> I'll get back to you with this one. Uh, um, and, that's, and then, I, in this case, well, I, will, I will reveal what is the correct answer, and then reassess the students again. You know? I was suggested to introduce the second stage uh, once I presented about my pedagogy. You know? so it's like, we don't need that because students are going to be all confident. Not really, not really. Some of the students are not happy yet, and it's very good that I know, that they know, and that at least we can do something about it, yeah? So the students vote, and then this is Turning Technologies PowerPoint, uh, uh, sorry, Turning Point for those who are curious about the, the, the kind of technology I use. There are many others. You can have a chat with me about that. You can show them the comparison between the proportion of correct and incorrect in the first round, which will be the blue bar, and in the second round. And students really love to look at this slide because they like to see that they're actually learned by talking to each other. They're really, really, uh, they're really, really engaged with the process. And this helps having students willing to respond to you. Yeah? I don't know if you tried Guglielmo's little uh, uh, question that he was giving before. I don't, I don't want to know whether you were right or wrong when you, when you gave the answer. It kind of hurts when you click a button and you see the result. It hurts much more than just guessing in your mind. Yeah? There is something psychological about it that we don't want to be wrong. Yeah? So the fact of committing yourself, clicking a button, doing something, is really, really important. Yeah? It makes you engage. Thanks to this approach that I followed, I also reviewed uh, my position versus uh, multiple choice questions. Yeah? Multiple choice questions do not enjoy a very good reputation. They're seen as trivializing learning. Oh, it's too easy. It's just a, you know, a closed answer, so you, you know, there is a probability to get it right anyway. But the important thing is the kind of question you craft. If I asked you, who amongst these economies crafted the concept of creative disruption? Keynes, Schumpeter, Smith, Malthus. That's a very stupid question to ask. You just need to recall in memory something that you read or you studied um, and give me the right answer. Whereas if I craft a complex problem where I have, uh, uh, I don't know, aggregate demand and aggregate supply moving all over the way, and very, very small variations and combination amongst uh, the possible multiple choices, that requires the students to know the model, apply the model, reflect on the model, and you know, introduce it in a real situation. So multiple choice questions can be very, very effective provided that you design the right ones. So every single year that I taught this module, I reviewed my question. I said, oh, this is not working. This is really good. And um, so it's good feedback to your teaching as well. So active learning is for the lecturer as well. It's for the lecturer as well, which is very, very important. So what happens when I go back to my office? I download all the uh, responses that I get from my students. and. Uh, I start drooling because I see an Excel spreadsheet full of, full of numbers. I start to code stuff. So very, very simple. For instance, I just call the one with N0 correct or incorrect. One and zero as confident, not confident. And then you can do all sorts of analysis. But in my opinion, a very important one is this. So um, in, this is, for instance, for one individual workshops. I can tell you that it applies to all the sessions that I run. Uh, the students who class themselves confident are generally the high attainment one. And the students who class themselves most of the times are not confident are generally the non-attainment. And you might, see, you might say, duh. Um, well, if you were expecting the result, you would be wrong, because there is a huge psychological educational, um, educational psychology literature uh, that claims that those who are underperforming are also extremely bad at self-assessing their performance, which is disastrous. Which means that students who are struggling are those who are never coming to see you. And not just because they're lazy, but because they don't even have a clue about what's going on with their learning. Yeah? So this result is actually very good. Yeah? And, and it's not obvious. So for the record, 
this effect of like being not very uh, proficient and being aware, unaware of it is called an Kruger effect. I got a counterfactual for you because uh, I alternate a week workshops and a week seminars. So in seminars, there is no active learning. At the beginning of each seminar, I, see, I give them a simple paper worksheet like this. So they got three or four questions, same format, they give me an answer, and they rate their confidence as well. Um, and then I compare the results between uh, seminars and workshops, and guess what? Same lecturer, same material, same students, Similar format, but not exactly identical, and the results are completely different. So the Dunning-Kruger effect appears here, as it is uh, predicted in the literature. And that to me is a, an indication, I don't want to claim proof, but it's an indication that when I work within an active learning environment, things are actually working quite right. I cover one question at a time, I have students talking to each other, I have, I, they are focused on task, and things are working. If they go through the same problem in a traditional way on a, on a test uh, seat, things are not working as well. I was telling you about the feedback that you get out of that. So active learning for the lecturer, active learning for the lecturer. What you can do is looking at the number of correct responses the first time you, you ask a question, and look at the learning that is generated from peer instruction, which is the difference between the second time students answer a question, and the first time students answer a question, yeah? So learning gain here and initial response. Same thing you can do with the confidence because you ask the self-assessment questions twice through. And what you get is something that is quite common in uh, the peer instruction literature. If the initial proportion of responses is very little, the correct response is very low, obviously knowledge is not gonna spread in the class. So the learning gain is going to be very little. If the initial proportion is very high, you crafted that question too easy. Therefore, there is not going to be much learning. Students are learning. A lot of students already know the answer. So you can estimate what is the perfect, the ideal proportion of students that should respond correctly in the first round in order to generate a maximum learning through peer instruction. And I sit there, look at my questions, and I say, OK, this question is too easy. This question is too hard. And every year, I recalibrate. Um, so little by little, I built my data set and my question bank, and it's working quite right. Same thing you can do with the confidence question. Another thing you can demonstrate is that when uh, students learn, so the confidence gain increases, uh, sorry, the learning gain increases, their confidence increases as well. Um, today, I, I, I presented this uh, at the uh, Development Economic Education Conference, but please come and uh, ask me if you are interested in that. So uh, last but not least, what do, what do the students think about all, all this? So when I teach my first lecture and I show up uh, in class meeting the students, um, I tell them, look, we are going to use this method called peer instruction in workshops. We are going to work according to this approach. Uh, what do you think about you teaching to each other it's going to be even more effective than me teaching me, or equally effective as me teaching uh, uh, you. Yeah. They don't like it at all. They don't like the idea at all. And then I ask a very similar question uh, at the end of each workshop, and you get this kind of result. But I'm going to admit it. That might be very leading. Yeah? I've been accused of this being too leading. So it's not been a very strong support of active learning. So I did something else. And I told my students, OK, not talking about pre instruction on RTL learning, simple evaluation with a lot of other questions. And the question here was, we, you know, you've been taught through lectures, you've been taught through seminars, you had office hours, you had uh, workshops, you had material on Blackboard, which is our VLE. Which of this component, which of this moment, you, you think it generated the highest learning for you? 50% alone the same workshops, which is the place where active learning is taking place. And then, of course, the students got different preferences. You know, seminars are still important. Some sort of active learning is taking place there. But workshops, 50% alone, in my opinion, is a very strong result. And what's the participation rate now? Oh, this was, uh, uh, I don't remember uh, precisely, but it was very high. Um, because this I gave paper in class. So it, it was very, very high. 
I had my whole class, I think it was a revision session, so. <laughs> um, so, what I would recommend if you want to engage with this is, you know, um, give feedback to the students. Tell students what you're doing. There are no secrets. And they actually quite like to hear why this pedagogy is working, what is going on, why you're doing what you're doing. Especially if you're doing something that is quite alien to them, it's quite important to treat them as adults and say, I'm doing this because of that. Yeah? Um, get back to them. So I, I provide a report on a Blackboard about what is going on, the technology you use, which, whatever it is, is probably going to be able to produce nice reports about distributions and uh, all this can actually go online. And the important thing is that you can find your own balance. You can adapt that um, and see what that is suitable to you. Um, I presented you with quite a lot of stuff, and, and there will be even more. Um, it took me five, six years to develop all this. You know? So if you never experimented anything in terms of active learning or peer instruction, uh, by all means, don't get scared. You, know? you start small, but steady. Strongest table, is that so? you know, you start, uh, you know, steady, and you know, try to flip one workshop, and then you flip two workshops, and little by little, you see to which extent you're willing to go. Um, giving up material, that's that's extremely important. You know, that question was asked before. Um, what, why are we so obsessed with this idea that we need to cover stuff? Are we supposed to cover stuff, or are we supposed to teach students? the ability to solve any kind of problem they're going to encounter in the future. Yeah? This, to me, is much more important. So you can cover three topics. You can cover five topics. You can cover a whole textbook. But the important thing is the students, once they go out there, are able to solve these problems by themselves. So if you teach the students how to solve problems by themselves and to know where they stand, in my opinion, mission accomplished and well done you. So um, it took me time to give up material. Every year I've been cutting a little bit, um, but I will never go back. And it takes, uh, it takes some courage um, because we are attached to it, you know, and, and probably we've been taught in a different way as well, you know, um, which makes it difficult, um, but it's most certainly uh, worthwhile. Um, and by all means, if you are interested in doing some pedagogical research or if you are doing already pedagogical research on this or related topic, to please get in touch because I'm more than happy to share uh, what I'm doing with you, working with you, helping you out with the data analysis and whatever. And some shameless promotion, something is coming out uh, very, very soon um, on the International Review of Economics Education, so you can see a bit more of that uh, online very, very soon. And uh, that's me done. If you got any question, I can pick them up. We got five minutes, don't we? We have, yeah. both of the presenters, because one is really not uh, flipping lectures, but um, abolishing them. And uh, you are not quite doing that. But it seems to me that even the word lecture is misleading, that in both cases, um, you're not abolishing meeting with the group. And I was discussing that uh, with this question of um, the history of, uh, of what Alvin had pointed out about lectures and the medieval tradition. And it was once actually a Ukrainian colleague who suggested to me many years ago that the lecture comes from Bologna, it comes from the sermon, from the gathering of the group, and there is a value in that, not in what happens from the bully pulpit, but the gathering of the group. And I've seen that sometimes at LSE when 9 a.m. macro lectures, nobody goes to them, they watch the video, but on the occasion that they do go, they're elated to see the others. So I like that idea very much. The question is, how are we going to get this across to people? Okay, that is in this room, I think we, at least I, I wasn't even sold. I just love the way you, you both put it. You know, I, what I learned from you was how to say it, but I've already <laughs> shared your views. And, and the two variants are possible. We don't have to argue about which is right. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can try them both and mixes and the same person can do both depending on it. I know that we who have, I don't know if others do, we have 850, and that's already broken down into two group, you know. So we have to go to 220 to 250. We've already said that and teach for, t as I gather Harvard does, in fact. Um, 
but um, the question of convincing people, I just want to leave it with everybody here, it covering stuff, that basically we're all still covering stuff. So we're not going to get there, I would suggest, except in su to some degree collectively through the economics network. That is, on having the idea of what minimum stuff is that does have to be covered, and it's pretty, you know, as minimal as is necessary, understanding that maybe too much, but a lot of our stuff is driven by the fact, in many places, and that includes you, um, that uh, at least 25 to 40 percent of the students will have things like the Government Economic Service, the Bank of England, graduate work, banks that use econometrics now, all these things. So there is stuff to cover, right? It's just the question of minimizing that stuff. And I think that has to come with some statement. I mean, we don't have to put it out like, stop covering stuff, but some sort of agreement on the minimum core curriculum or something um, so that when it's not on it, it doesn't have to be covered. That would be my idea and what, yeah. one of the things that could come out of this um, collaboration, including, as I said, in this case, through the network. So that's my, my plea, basically, <laughs> that um, I really want to see what you've yeah. done, which is fabulous. Uh, more, uh, let's get some progress on this. Yeah. Uh, I would say that uh, you start off, of course, within your institution, and some sort of constructive alignment must yeah. be there. So um, the way I've done it and the way I was so relaxed about it, trust me, it took me time, huh? it yeah. took me time. Um, but the way I, was so, um, I am now so relaxed about it is that, of course, I sat with the people teaching at second year and the people teaching at third year and sacrificed a bit of this idea of parallelizing the curriculum, uh, which actually some, some students find quite boring. You know? They say, oh, I've seen this already in first year, I've seen already in, in second year. You know? So you have to see it two more times. I, I don't want to. I don't want to say that this paralyzing entirely the curriculum is the right thing to do. I will not go. I'm, I'm, I'm never been one for extreme solutions, but most certainly saying, you know, what I what I agree with my second year, me uh, was okay. I'm going to look after the short run, and you're going to cover the second, uh, the, the 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 medium long run, and then in third year we're going to look at topics, and that's the way we split. Uh, we split uh, the job for uh, for all of us, and that's the way we solve the problem. Uh, obviously, if you follow a textbook very tightly, you know, each textbook co cover everything from beginning to end. And we were having this discussion today. You choose what is right for you. Or even out of core, you choose what is right for you and how to make it good for your institution, for your students, and for you as a teacher as well, I believe. I don't know whether Guglielmo has no, something I, to add. No, I, I fully agree. I think it's, it's an issue of having some sort of institutional approach within, within the department. Uh, I think the challenge is to bring people together and uh, to agree on uh, distributing material across, across modules. But, um, I mean, um, I, I see, I see uh, um, within our curriculum at Queen Mary that there is a sense that uh, by the end of year two, students should have uh, reached a quite high level of advanced macroeconomics. Uh, I say, well, do we really need it? Well, can we leave it for the final year instead and can we focus instead on, uh, on a deeper understanding? And, but um, I agree with you, I think there is a need, there is a need to to have a discussion, an internal discussion on how to, to redistribute the load. Because uh, I think at the end of the day, the, the question is, what do we want to form? Do we want to form uh, educated, critical, analytical guys who can go out there? And even if they don't know something, they know where to get the information, then can, they can make some, something out of it. I think if you can produce these kind of guys, hey, well done. Uh, so I love the idea about engaging the students, asking questions. Uh, but all the questions that I've seen were pretty much straightforward and like testing concepts. So mm -hmm. I was wondering uh, how would you deal with quantitative questions or questions that like you already tested the concept, but then you want to know if the student can apply that question to a certain context. So yeah, you already test the concept, and then you want to know if the student can apply that question to a given Mm -hmm. context so like it takes more time so they are not so quick a, as those questions yeah. and also maybe they're they're more quantitative so it's harder to test them as multiple choices and so on and um, the problem with I mean the, the problem that I'm facing is that obviously I want to promote active learning in a large classroom environment so I have to come down with some compromises. So multiple choice is the only way that I can handle this number. But the idea is that the peer structure is kicking in then and students are teaching each other. 
And students have got this advantage that they've just learned something. I learned that more than 20 years ago. And, and that makes me not better teaching than themselves. Yeah? Um, so in a session, just to get back to your question, I will have, I will have you know, when we consider the Bloom taxonomy, I will have, I will have questions that rank uh, differently on, uh, on, on the Bloom's taxonomy um, pyramid. So, I mean, I might actually find it useful out of eight and question, have a couple where I'm recalling concepts here and there just to make sure the students are there. But those are actually going very fast. So the time that I'm going to devote to this question is very fast. Students give me an answer pretty fast, uh, hopefully. Um, and then I can try to climb up. You know. So generally, I cover two lectures for each workshop that I run. So I go, I don't know, uh, labor market and aggregate demand and aggregate supply as a topic. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to overarch across all these topics and build a little by little. And then I'm just going to move in waves. I mean, I don't, I don't have a particular plan uh, about difficult, easy, difficult, easy. But there are going to be some numbers playing and some model applying, uh, some recalling. So even on, on, on the Bloom's taxonomy, you're just going to move up and down. Um, and that's going to help the students because, yeah, you just want to make sure that everybody gets something right. That's quite important for their confidence levels as well. I don't know whether I'm addressing the point you're making. Um, but yeah, little by little, the important thing is that for each of these questions, you maximize the amount of learning that that question is able to generate in the classroom. And so if at all in the ideal world you want to be here and you want to have the maximum learning, at the end of the day, in fact, you got some trade-offs that you have to face. And only practice, I'm afraid, and only trying and then uh, revising and trying again is just going to take you to a point in which you re reach the optimum or you know, the best that you can do in your teaching. Yeah, but uh, for quantitative questions, would you set the answers as like ranges or as specific numbers? Um, uh, I don't tell many of those, I have to say, because, uh, because of the nature of the subject I teach, which is. Uh, more like moving curves, and like so, it will be a lot of upwards, downwards, left or right. Um, when I go on numbers, I just try to predict what are going to be the possible mistakes the students are making. So, you you know, is that a number, or is the, the inverse of that, or is that the inverse of that minus one? And I'm just going to think about which possible mistakes. But there is like a theoretical model on the back of that that lead lead you to take to make that mistake, isn't it? Um, so that hopefully students can clarify to each other what is going on. Yes. So. There is a sort of second guessing exercise. Not many numerical. In my experience, obviously, if you teach econometrics or something like that, or statistics, you might have many more of that. So I think um, we'll have to draw it to a close. So can we just thank uh, Fabio and Guglielmo again? Thank you. Um,